This is Champagne Problems, where we come together to explore the gray areas of drinking. This is a judgment-free zone where we can all take a look at how we make decisions about our relationship with alcohol. Welcome back, my favorite people. Today, we're speaking with the one and only Gabby Bernstein. Gabby, as many of you know, is a highly sought after international speaker, number one New York Times bestselling author and creator and host of the successful podcast, Dear Gabby. Patrick and I met Gabby down at the Global Exchange Conference in the fall, and we were blown away by her keynote. And here we are today speaking to Gabby. Let's go. Gabby Bernstein, welcome to Champagne Problems. So happy to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're honored to have you on. We're going to start with some rapid fire questions, if that's cool with you, just to get mm -hmm. to know you. First question, what was your first live music concert and where? Well, this probably wasn't the first one. But the first one was probably like James Taylor at in in Massachusetts, like with my mom or something. You know what I mean? Carolina yeah. boy. Carolina boy. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then, but the one I like the first like real concert I went to that I remember being like by myself at a concert was Jamiroquai at the Roxy. Ooh, nice. Nice. Where'd you say? At the Roxy. Oh man. That dude's styling. That guy kills. Big fan. Kills. What uh what movie have you seen the most times? Sixteen Candles. <laughs> love it. You love it. Uh what nickname do you get called by your your people? Gabby. My name well, is Gabby. Very Nikki. Well, my name is Gabrielle. <laughs> my real name is Gabrielle. So my Got nickname you. is Gabby. Or what, Gabs. Um, I get Gabs a lot too. Gabs, Gabs. There we go. What meal do you like to cook for yourself the most? Mm, tacos. If you do that. Tacos. tacos. Nice. What do you put in those tacos? Mm, turkey, chili, cheese, guacamole, you name it. Beans. Love it. Mm -hmm. What's awesome. your number one vacation spot? Ooh. Uh, well, my family and I all went to Barbados and rented this house in Barbados, and we call it Kimberly's house because the woman who managed the house was so awesome, and her name is Kimberly. So my son and my husband will be like, do you want to go back to Kimberly's house? So I think yes. that the whole like vibe of the house and the whole experience and just – you know, just the 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 semi private vibe of that experience was like, let's do that again. Yeah, love it. Love the people in Barbados. Barbados. I've surfed there before. Rihanna, Rihanna's hometown, island. man. You know, that's right. Yeah, that's right. All right, now we know you. Um, we're gonna try to make this conversation a little more interactive as opposed to interview style. That's just kind of how we do. It makes it for more. Uh, entertaining, exciting, and valuable information. Um, but let's start with your sobriety. Um, let's just come right out of the bat and talk about how you reached sobriety. I got sober on October 2nd of 2005. My first drug was love. And I became yeah. addicted to relationships at the age of 16. And then at the point that I started to feel a lot of shame around that addictive pattern, my drug and alcohol abuse got much more serious. So it was really when I was about 21, 22 that I started dabbling with cocaine. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to put down this relationship. It's too shameful. I keep ending up with people that I don't think are that great. I'm going to pick up the drugs. And I went hard. And it was hard and fast, which was really lucky for me. I probably spent two years doing heavy drugs, not heavy drugs, but cocaine, but heavily, yeah. you know, daily habit, yeah. uh, losing my memory, nosebleeds, 98 pounds, ulcers mm. in my stomach, you know, not showing, not showing up for life in any way, shape or form. I ran my own business. It was representing nightclubs and PR. And so like, I was just like, oh, every man. everybody did coke, you know, it was like the <laughs> yeah, whole, yeah. Like, there was no, there was no like. I just, the, my whole world was like, that's just what people do. Like people don't yeah. do anything else. And I was also 25, you know, 21, 22, 23. And, um, and that's in the city in New York city. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a hard, fast bottom and it was meant to be, it was absolutely meant to be. It was part of my life's journey. It was part of my life's, my soul's choice in this lifetime was to, to, to hit bottom fast so I could wake up young and so that I could be a messenger for recovery in whatever form that would be, whether it be spiritual recovery or addiction recovery or personal 
healing and recovery. And that was no accident. My soul, before I came in, said, let's have all these childhood problems and let's have all these ab ab abusive experiences and whatever it was that I needed to have to get to a place where I needed to have trauma to become an addict to then make the choice. When did you realize that that's what was going on and how did you get that insight? Like when did I realize that this was my soul's path? Yeah. You know, I think that I chose to do good with my recovery very early on and in the service of others, just like you would in a 12-step program, in the service of others, you find your purpose and you find the God within you. And it was very clear to me, there was this Joan of Arc quote that I loved. It was, I am not afraid I am born to do this. And it really resonated with me because it felt like, yeah, I signed up for this. I signed up for this. This was a soul's contract. And <laughs> this is the- And, and that happened at like six months, three months, 10 days, two years. When when did you kind of have that? Maybe like, maybe like the one year mark, you know, really about a year into my sobriety, I started speaking publicly about it. I started giving talks, not just about my sobriety, but about my personal growth and spiritual journey. And so yeah. as soon as I started to get on those stages speaking about- these topics, that's when I was like, this is my purpose. This is what I'm here to do. This isn't a job. This is a mission. This isn't a uh, just like a fun life choice. It's it's my soul's purpose. And yeah, I think I knew that real, real early on in my sobriety. Yeah. What was your exposure like to the spiritual path prior to your recovery journey? I was brought up visiting ashrams and I was taught to meditate and I was given breath practices as a child. But the real spiritual awakening happened for me when I got sober. I'd had these like tastes of spiritual development and I was really involved in the, in the youth group in my, in my town when I was a kid. And so I had that pull and I had a hippie mom. So I had that pull and that education around it. But my heartstrings were pulled towards spirituality most when I hit bottom and got sober because I did what they told me to do in my program. And, you know, it's like, get on your knees and talk to God. And I didn't know who God was, but the language of it's a God of your own understanding was all I needed to yeah. really claim what God meant to me. One of the things that kind of blew me away when I heard you speak at the, both of us at the Global Exchange was, you know, I, I was, I was really intrigued with your kind of like clinical knowledge um, and how you could, because this is something that I've always been obsessed with, is how do we bridge that gap between spirituality and science? Mm -hmm. And the way that you articulated the concepts that you did and kind of interweaved it through your own story, um, it was very clear to me that, that you have found a way to bridge those two things. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of want to know how that kind of came about and, and, you know, how did you find that 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 clinical piece you know i know i understand that you found that through your own healing journey like kind of simultaneously with the spirituality piece but how do those two things overlap for you they're interchangeable they're inter so they're interconnected because when i wrote my book happy days it was really a reflection of my trauma recovery which of course includes my addiction recovery because that's all from the trauma and in that book i write about the therapeutic models that were there for me that I actually feel God guided me to and how spiritual the specific therapeutic models that I have chosen to work with, how spiritual they are, somatic experiencing, internal family systems therapy, EMDR, EFT. I mean, just, just the, they're in my opinion, deeply spiritual practices. And I also share about how if it weren't for my spiritual devotion and my spiritual foundation and my relationship with God, I wouldn't have been guided to those practices. So God was in all of it, even the medication when I had to get on an antidepressant with postpartum postpartum depression and uh, suicidal ideation. I had to get on meds and I decided to say, God is in the meds. Yeah. And so the through line and the thread between all of the therapeutic practices that I've chosen the medication that I took, you know, everything is, is God, is my spiritual faith. Mm. Mm. Um, all right. So <clears throat> for some of our listeners who 
often we do a lot of education on this show and you know people are tuning in who have not been down these types of journeys uh, so we like to kind of pull it back and educate them you know almost prelim like a preliminary uh, here's what to look for here's what to expect here's how to go into it can you give a little bit of an overarching um, definition description of spirituality I believe that spirituality is unique to all of us, but it is, it is, in my words, connecting to a presence beyond your physical sight and trusting and having faith in a energy of love that is within you and around you and guiding you and protecting you. And when we're in sync and aligned with that presence, our life becomes a lot easier and we start to feel a lot safer and we feel more guided and directed rather than pushing and controlling. And tapping into that presence, no matter what it is for you and however you connect to it through meditation or through prayer or through physical activity or through 12-step meetings, connecting to that energetic presence is the greatest gift you'll ever receive if you choose for it. Mm. Thank you. Um, let's talk about trauma a little bit. Um, Dr. Mate. Trauma is the cause of just about everything, specifically addiction, uh, whether that's behavioral or, or, or substance related. Um, do you think everybody has some level of trauma that needs to be worked through? I like to use that definition of trauma with a big T and trauma with a small T, because not everybody has big T trauma. Right. Many people don't. And it's it's a little bit dangerous to compare the two while well, I have actually historically said, oh, well, everybody's got trauma and we all have different, the same the same coping mechanisms. Well, that's not entirely true because those of us who have big T trauma, like abuse or, or uh, living through a catastrophic event or physical violence or all of the above, those of us who've experienced that kind of trauma, particularly at a young age, have actually a lot of have compromised brains and nervous systems. Whereas somebody who experienced a small T trauma, like being told they were stupid by a teacher, does have protection mechanisms and ways of being that are similar to someone with big T trauma, but they're not frozen in time. They're not locked up. They're not needing to live in a way where they're in hypervigilance. Maybe in certain situations they get hypervigilant, but not in all of life. And they have an ability to be more present in the human experience than someone who has a big T trauma and has frozen and has not processed that or didn't have the ability to process it as a child. How important do you feel like it is for somebody to have that kind of spiritual understanding in order to engage into their own, in, in their own trauma work or healing process? I wouldn't say that it should stop anybody. So let's say someone is not identifying as spiritual, but they want to heal their trauma. You know, just do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes. Don't let any semantics get in the way. I believe it is a spiritual journey to undergo trauma treatment because you're, you're, you're retrieving these parts of yourself that got blown out and it's, it is like a soul retrieval. And I do believe that when you work in communication with a sponsor or a therapist or a coach, that there's God in that relationship. But if that's not what someone's belief is, and that's going to hold them back from getting the necessary healing, then just call it whatever you want. Yeah. Ever since you introduced us to Tammy, <laughs> we've all been, we've all been reaching out to her and setting up sessions and, and, and doing some work with her. She's brilliant. Uh, She's brilliant. She really is brilliant. She's actually I, a uh, big character in my book, Happy Days. You know, my, my, my therapist is, re is referenced throughout and there's multiple therapists. So while I have one core therapist, like when I reference my therapist, sometimes it's Tammy, you know, sometimes it's Tammy. That's so cool. I personally have, have done some work with her. Um, I would say I have a low level, I mean, a lowercase t trauma. Um, and so we were doing some work where you know, just digging into subconscious stuff and, and uh, spiritual 
uh, truth and 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 finding this this innocence in my child. You know, I, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe other people don't, but it was just incredibly valuable. Um, and even since then, obviously, there's there's time to to kind of heal from that exact or that actual experience of that work. Um, but I would love to hear. You know, I've I've seen some of the things um, you've said about what doing the trauma work has done for you, some of the values, some of the benefits, just in existence, physically, mentally. Can you share some of that as to what it's like on the other end of doing some of that work? Yes, I love that question. So my my book, Happy Days, the subtitle is The Guided Path from Trauma to Profound Freedom and Inner Peace. I've often said that there's no fucking way I would have put my face on the book cover if I couldn't stand behind my own profound freedom and inner peace. And that's the reward of the work. That is that is the promise of a book like that. That is the promise of going on that journey. Because now I... I mean, God, it makes me so sad to think back to where I was, but I know I had to be there to get here. Mm -hmm. But now I am in my body. I'm in my authentic truth, as Gabor Mate says. I am in my physical sensations. I'm in the present moment. I once heard uh, Peter Levine, the founder of Somatic Experiencing, say that trauma is the inability to be present. I'm now present. I'm able to really be in the room. Mm. Mm. What other modalities did you kind of engage in to do your trauma work? I mean, I know we know Tammy's like an EMDR specialist, and I know you're a big internal family systems fan. And like, well, what what do you think? I mean, was it the combination of all those different modalities that and the spiritual piece that you feel like gave you the ability to heal? Yeah. So um, in the book, I talk about the journey, really, of my trauma recovery. And I believe that the spiritual foundation and the meditation and the yoga and the the uh, spiritist movements that I followed and the uh, cracking open to spirit guides, all of that preliminary commitment for over a decade really set me up to be in a place of enough safety to remember trauma that was dissociated. Yeah. And then upon remembering, have the bravery to, to do whatever it took to get to get it, to, to reprocess it. And so I believe that spiritual, my spiritual connection guided my path. And so it began with the somatic experience and I started doing a lot of body-based work and then very quickly was led to Tammy and started practicing EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And that's a practice where you stimulate both sides of your brain to help you reprocess historical wounds. I mean, there's go listen to the episode with these guys on it. And I then started to incorporate IFS, but I'd actually been practicing internal family systems therapy in my therapy for a decade before I even realized that it was IFS. I started listening. Yeah, yeah. I started listening to Dick Schwartz and I was like, wait, that's that guy's talking about the yeah. thing I do in my therapy. I'm <laughs> that's like, what I do. He invented that, yeah. you know? And so um really quickly befriended Dick and had him on my show and just was just so enamored by him and the work and his and his spirit. God, you know, it's such a privilege to be able to be friends with your teachers and to be friends with the human being whose work changed your life. Oh, and so yeah. he's such a beloved friend and we haven't known each other very long, but there's just, just a, such a strong connection. And, you know, right now I'm working on my 10th book and it's all about IFS. And it's all nice. about oh, nice. taking the model of internal family systems therapy and making it self-help, making it easy for people to use. And I, you know, I have his blessing and it's like the most extra, like I can't wait to get back to my desk to go right. Like it's just such a good feeling. <laughs> and uh, that therapy of all is the one that changed me. Mm. Mm. And I'm assuming that you still utilize a lot of those techniques in your own self-care practice. Every goddamn day, man. Yeah. What is that? What does that look like for you? What is your kind of you know self care like you know discipline look like? Well, from an IFS perspective, I'll give you an example. So today, I got on a call with my husband, who's the CEO of our company, and my COO, who might as well be like my sister because we're that close. And I typed something into Slack that was like a part of me, part of me that was like, you know, 
kind of the part of me that I would call the what the fuck is going on here part of me, the, like the part that's like, you know, pissed off that things aren't work, aren't, aren't being organized the way I want them to be. It's kind of a controlling um, part. And yeah. that part showed up on, and so I'm talking about this from an IFS standpoint, that we have all these different parts of ourselves and their protection mechanisms. And that part was like, you guys, I just fixed this whole thing and I should have been at the top of this from the beginning. And, you know, there, th there wasn't like a necessary blame, but I, but they felt that blaming tone. And so they get on a call with me and are like, whoa, 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 like, you know, telling me how they feel. And I had to be the witness of that part. And I had the, uh, now with my IFS background, I could see from a different lens and not get defensive and be more protective, but instead see, okay, I didn't want to hurt their feelings, but there was a part of me that did want to get through to them, like wanted their attention, you know, and I could notice that part of me that was there. And I got to know it a little bit more. And I'm like, oh, that's the part of me that feels like if I don't do it, nobody else will. And then I ch checked in more and I got to a softer, gentler place where I was calm and confident to just take care of my side of the street, but also take care of that youthful part of me that was protecting me. Yeah. And so I got to speak up for myself and apologize in the same breath. And so that process of just, of just connecting in, turning in, who's in the room, what part of me is on this call right now? What part of me is activated in this moment? And how can I soothe that part of me so it can just settle and not create more, tr more drama in my life? That process, I want to teach to the masses. I want that to be, yeah. you know, notice it. What do you know about it? And then ask the part of you, what do you need right now? And that part of me said, I need to take care of my side of the street and apologize because there's some shame here. And I also need to say what was up for me, which is that like, I just feel that things got, that things fell through the cracks. So that's a perfect segue. Let's go into manifestation because I'm sure there's some overlying or overlapping parts to that. Um, and we're going to do it more interactively here, if that's okay with you. I personally have always dealt with anxiety, have always dealt with imposter syndrome, lower self-esteem. I can, don't really need to tell you why, but the stuff, the stuff in my childhood led to that. Um, I'm now creator, lead host of a podcast, and we're expanding out into a bigger company. How do I manifest my goals? You heal the beliefs that hold you back from being a magnet for that desire. Okay. Not the answer you wanted. No, I know what it, I, no, I know it's work. <laughs> it really is work. because we manifest who we are. Yeah. So when we are wanting to attract more into our life, we have to be brave enough to witness all the belief systems that we carry that are blocking us from allowing that to become a reality. Yeah. And then we have to do the big heavy lift of doing the work. You know, I, I said that my book, Happy Days, is my greatest manifesting book. Even though I wrote a book called The Universe Has Your Back and Super Attractor, Happy Days is my greatest manifesting book because if you do the work in Happy Days and you commit to your inner well-being, then manifesting becomes easy. Can you talk about the kind of concept of letting go and, and how you get there and how that's um, connected to that idea of manifestation? Well, I think a lot of people think that letting go and surrender is giving up, but I don't see it that way. I see it as a giving over. When we surrender and let go, a true, genuine surrender is letting go of what you think you need and welcoming in that spiritual presence to take the wheel. What are, what are some of the things that, that you do or that you teach in order to you know, give people or support people in the ability to do that? The first thing I would say is prayer. So when we pray, we suspend our disbelief momentarily. And when we pray, we, even for a brief moment, have the chance to feel into what it feels like to let something go to a power beyond us. And so if you have a prayer practice, develop it and develop it more and pray more and pray more and pray more until it begins to be a habit that you are just so reliant upon. I also believe that letting go requires really recognizing what is thriving in your life and focusing on that rather than focusing on what isn't or what you think you need. Because the more we think we need 
something, the further away we are from attracting it. And so when we become present with what is in this moment and we enjoy the thriving things in this moment, that would be my advice to you, Robbie, is like, just focus on what's thriving right here, right now, rather than thinking about where it has to go and what has to be. Because when you're in the joy of what it is that you're creating or doing or being, you're manifesting more of what you want. Do you hear that? I love it. I know you are very much around women's empowerment. We've got a lot of female listeners, a lot of women listeners. We would love for you to just give them a quick um, guide into how to how to jump into that world, whether it's reading a couple of your books, if you want to just give a, you know, ones that they should be directed to anything to our women you can you can give yeah well i'm actually really focused on people empowerment but as it relates to women there are of course gender roles that affect us differently Mm -hmm. and marginalized communities that have different experiences and as a as a woman i would say what i've really taken to most recently is in Gabor Mate's book, The Myth of Normal, he talks about, with with a lot of respect, the role that women play in society, in their household, in their careers now, and just the consistent managing and keeping it all together. And I would challenge the women listening who may be resonant with that to start to decide what areas of their life they want to give over. Because the more that we try to keep it all together, the more we disconnect from our authentic truth. Actually, just I just read that part in that book. Like two that man ago. changed my life in one Zoom phone call. <laughs> because yeah. he kept listening to me and he was listening to me and he said, Three times in this conversation, you said, I'm just keeping it all together. I'm just keeping it all together. And he helped me for just really see that mirror back to myself of like, oh, yeah, that's not my authentic self. I'm going to go ask for more help. I'm going to go say what I need. I'm going to go speak up for me. (sighs) Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. This podcast is supposed to be alcohol centric. We haven't touched on that at all today. And we don't have to. Um, Give us the three best additions to your life since you gave up alcohol. Everything. (laughs) But I mean, the most most important is my marriage, my son, and my mission. Perfect. Amen. Final power question. Gabby Bernstein, why do you care so damn much? I care about people. I care about people waking up to their truth. And I care about humankind. Because if we all began to think with the thoughts of love, if we all began to, if if everyone, the collective, were able to have that kind of spiritual adjustment, everything around us would change. The environment would change, war would stop, political divisiveness would end, people would feel safe again, we wouldn't need such violence in the world. And I know that and I believe that completely, wholeheartedly. And so my mission is to wake as many people up to that love within them so that they can be expressions of that love in their own lives. Well, thanks for leading the way. Yeah, Gabby, you're an angel. You guys are so <laughs> cute. I love you. I love, I love you. you. And thanks, yeah. for, thanks for being here and thank you. taking the time to I'm proud of you guys. I'm so hang proud with of us. You. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And I I'll tell you this. It. I remember saying I want to be on that podcast even back back then because this is a topic I always want to show up for. And I'm just so proud of you. So keep going, man. Yeah. Men. Thank you. Keep going, thank men. You. We love you. <laughs> thank you. Love you guys. Yeah. 
The information and opinions shared on this podcast are solely those of the hosts and guests and are not a substitute for medical advice. If you feel like you may need professional help, here are some resources. For the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration hotline, call 1-800-662-4357 or visit smsa.gov. For listeners in the Charlotte, North Carolina community, visit dilworthcenter.org or call 704-372-6969 or visit theblanchardinstitute.com or call 704-288-1097.